Today on our Tech for Business podcast, Todd, our COO and CISO, and Nate, our Director of Cybersecurity and VCSO, will be diving deep into zero trust uh, maturity journey. So we're starting with this traditional stage. But before we get there, I'd like to ask, why is zero trust important? Why do we keep talking about this subject? Uh, the short answer is, <laughs> it, it, instead of my normal, it depends. This one is, it's, it's time, right? It, it's time. <laughs> I, I, it, it seems like it's a weird thing to say when you see that there is the the industry has troubles adopting a lot of things in general. But when it comes to protecting networks, it is time to do it. The traditional moat and castle wall really doesn't work anymore. The vast majority of companies have things in the cloud. They have things where they have individuals working remote. Um, things have just changed. And, and that that old methodology just doesn't work anymore. And so if you know, and we do look at the world of cybersecurity, that that plan doesn't work, then that means that you need to look at the next thing. And the next thing is zero trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we, we've seen this coming for years, right? This isn't new. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at when zero trust was first coined. But I think in the past, I've looked at it and it was around 2014-ish or so. So think, it's yeah. it's been it's been 10 years <laughs> that this has been coined and working towards. Um, you know, here at CIT, we've been pushing security for many, many years. I, I think almost since that zero trust concept. Um, and unfortunately, the adoption is still pretty abysmal <laughs> uh, when it comes to some of these percentages. We can get into other percentages uh, and stuff, but there's there's just a foundational change in the market as well right is we've talked in the past about when the government is being a, the leader on something it, it's should really indicate that okay this has been well fleshed out and once that rock starts rolling it's going to be really hard to stop it and so um again todd kind of to todd's point there is it's time if the government is working faster than our small businesses, <laughs> we got to do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just a, the quick analogy that I have is if you look at the world when it came to EDR and, and we we made the big EDR push again, it was time. We did that almost three years ago. Um, our adoption is ridiculous. Industry wide, it's not. Um, but it's the same concept. Antivirus does not work anymore. It is not catching what it needs to do, which, again, at that point, you have to say, why am I even paying for this? This is garbage. It's time to move to the next thing. Same concept here is it's not saying that your old network was garbage. It still works. It just isn't staying up to speed with what's going on with the world, unfortunately. We kind of um, began talking about this a little bit before the podcast start, and I'm so curious. We're talking about this um, journey in maturity for zero trust. Can you explain what the difference of being at this traditional stage and what businesses are doing now. So I think the example was, I have MFA, so I must be on the zero trust journey. And and the ans the short answer to that was kind of no. Can you explain that to me? <laughs> I, sure. I, I'll back up just briefly. Um, when we're using the phrase traditional, we're kind of using some of the nomenclature that's been put out there by the government. And so um, we were talking about this before the podcast started, too, is do you say CISA or do you say CISA? And the answer is yes. So both are correct in my book. <laughs> and uh, they have put out some guidance for it. And, and at the very base of the mountain, if you will, because they do use that graphic in their documentation, is the traditional uh, area. Um if you were to go to most organizations today and you were to talk to them and say, do you do the things that are listed in traditional and those are, do you have passwords? Do you have MFA? Can you give me a list of the things that are on your network? Most people would say, yes, I can. I would challenge them and say the reality is most of them probably couldn't do that without help. Um, so, for example, a lot of our customers will, I would ask them that question and they'd say, well, no, but you can do it. And the answer is, yeah, we mostly can, but we can't give you the full inventory knowing that it is 100% accurate. You may have something up on the shelf that's a spare that technically is part of your domain, but I don't see it. So it, does, it is not part of the inventory. Um, so 
Yes and no. I, you, We were talking about this to a degree, too, is MFA is a part of the journey, but it's just a piece of it. And and th there's a difference between having MFA and doing MFA correctly. Again, the world has changed. So an example, and this is a little tip for a, a future podcast, but there is you're getting into fishing uh, resistant MFA is where it's going to now. So it's it's not the same thing as just the good old fashioned MFA. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a. I know this is going to be a future podcast here soon because I'm, I'm helping drive it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> in the future, go take a look at uh, the identity and access management podcast. So you know, keep your eyes out for those ones. Um, but MFA is just one component to it. And what this is going to kind of play back into is part of the zero trust is um, organizations right now tend to be at more of an infancy state of either they don't have multi-factor or it's when a new user comes on board, they have to go enroll in it and, you know, but access is granted potentially before they get enrolled. Um, and so kind of let them in the door a little bit and then we'll take care of the multi-factor for future ones. Um, things like user creations or user terminations is those are all manual processes. So HR says we have a new employee onboarding, someone gets in. You know, IT, they spend the day setting up an account and maybe some of the permissions and uh, unfortunately, probably just copying into similar users permissions and just carrying roles across similar employees. And that's where you get those permission creeps. Um, and then when a user is terminated, how often is IT actually notified that uh, someone is terminated? Because I know in a lot of organizations, they're not notified right away. And then it's, well, that account was still open for another three days or four days or something, right? Um, or I've seen months. <laughs> um, but with that being said is, as we're talking about the security maturity models or you know the, the maturity levels essentially that we're going to be bringing uh, organizations through is we have other podcasts about you know, action items that you can do to start building the initial foundations and the blocks to get there. Today is a little bit more about the, the actual levels themselves rather than the mm -hmm. tactical components of it. Um, so either you you have nothing, you move into traditional, which is basically everything is very manual. Um, and then you can start talking about into the, like the initial components of zero trust, advanced and optimal. Um, these get exponentially harder and harder to implement. Um, and what this is going to mean is better documentation, better processes. Can you validate them over time that they are actually being done? Can you do automation to take over some of that to ensure that a user um, doesn't make a mistake? So, for example, when a user is terminated and HR initiates the termination process in the HR, HRIS, it goes through and automatically terminates access downstream, uh, right? Those are the things that start really getting you into those more mature levels of zero trust. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's all just, again, big stepping stones uh, that you mm -hmm. have to take uh, and the, the effort's going to continue increasing. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I want to kind of put a, a, a time stamp on where we're at today with, with traditional level of... Um, zero trust and just kind of getting into we started with that with the uh, mfa and we were saying a lot of organizations have mfa in place but just to kind of give you a highlight of where we're at today so we're first quarter of 2024 big organizations big bend well you know large organizations so you're talking your your american express targets etc their adoption is somewhere in about the 87 percent range as of this this point in time if you're looking at the mid-size organizations you're only at about 34 percent and if you're a small organization, you're only at about 27%. So while we said most organizations have started on the journey, the reality is the most have not actually done that. Most people haven't really done much of anything. Um, so again, just trying to do something to start to move the bar. We've been screaming at the top of our lungs that MFA is a requirement. It's non-negotiable. You absolutely have to have it for at least eight years. So again, we do tend to be a little bit ahead of the curve, but you know, this is a security podcast, so welcome aboard. Here we go. Um, <laughs> But kind of going down this path, and Nate was really getting into the details on this, and it's it's fantastic from my perspective because, of course, I'm a security nerd. 
But where you're looking at it is a lot of the stuff that we do is very, very manual today. Again, if I were to say, how do you deploy your antivirus EDR? Most organizations are probably doing that manually. They're going up to the computer, they're physically installing the software, they're physically downloading it, whatever the case may be. And as you're doing that, it, it, this is probably no surprise, you're, you're going to be inconsistent in it. It's a manual process. There's no automation in it. You're not going to be consistently as hardening the device the appropriate way. And because of that, you're just barely getting started. And that's great. Get started for Pete's sake. Let's go. But just understanding that what we're doing is just the basics. And so um, when Nate got into the identity piece, also a great piece, um, mm -hmm. most people are just using Active Directory today. And that is decent. But man, I do you remember how long ago Active Directory came out? Oh, gosh. Yeah, at least around old. the 2000s. That old. Yeah, so I, it's it this old. way, it's I was old. probably still in elementary school. <laughs> <laughs> but my point, time, my point here is that um, it's technology that really has not adapted with the change. Very similar to the way that antivirus was, is it's it's old. It does work, but it barely is is a starting point. And that's OK. It is a starting point, but we will have to go into the maturity piece. Um, Zero trust is complicated. There is a lot of to, lot to it, but there are natural ways to progress through it. And again, this is the starting point. At least get some of these pieces in place. Yeah, when you go take a look at it again. So this, I'm going to bring in a different framework into this rather than zero trust frameworks. But the mm -hmm. you know like the NIST cybersecurity framework again, CISA, CISA, they went and developed a different one and said, how do you get started? And if you go take a look at the the steps for that, it's the identify, detect, uh, sorry, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Identify is the first spot um, that you need to have, right? Is know what you have before you can start doing anything about it to pr better protect your environments. So if we take that and start blending it into the zero trust uh, framework, um, again, there's a graphic out there. I, I'm sure it'll be in the show notes, but there's different components to zero trust, which you should go work on identifying, right? It's the identity, you know, who and what access is being out granted out there, you know, all that type of stuff. D which devices do you have? Are they, you know, servers? Are they workstations, mobile devices? Are they prod network, dev network, whatever you have, right? What networks do you have? Um, so, is your network flat? Are, are you starting to isolate it into dedicated subnets and VLANs? Um, and then which applications do you have, you know, that are installed? This is one of the big things that we're seeing shift right now is um, organizations are being asked, do you have a, an inventory of all the software that's in your environment? And the answer is no, right? There's there's tools out there that do that um, and provide a lot of other services. Um, and then selfish plug, CIT has those uh, applications if you're looking for one. Um, but then also, what data do you have? Oftentimes, organizations don't know what data they have. Um, unfortunately, organizations love hoarding data, right? So um, Todd put this in my little comment. Active Directory has been around since 1999. You probably have data from 1999 sitting in your environments or older. Uh, I, I've I've worked with other organizations that are still holding millions of copies of microfiche, right? You know, all that type of stuff. So with that being said, He's HR comes and goes. You know, one of the things that often hangs around in networks are things like social security numbers of, you know, past employees and everything as they're doing their onboarding paperwork. Do you even know that you have that? So again, identify devices, networks, applications, workloads, and data. Blending that with the cybersecurity framework, start with identifying it. Otherwise, you can't make progress on the zero trust journey. And guess what? All of that's free because it just takes your time and effort to figure it out. My time is not free. Um, yeah, so so I would agree with that. I mean, if you don't know what you have, you can't do anything with it, right? You can't decide whether you're going to put any protections on it, if you're going to put any sort of um, logical control or, or administrative or anything else, which ultimately the administration piece was kind of the part two for me is once you've start to got a handle on what you have, the next step for me is starting to build your policies, right? You need to know what you're going to do. If you can't frame out, this is how we're going to do things to make it consistent, 
obviously you won't do that. So building a policy that kind of starts with what your security intent is, a security policy typically does that, you know, it gets into all the the typical stuff or references other documents where you've got the acceptable uses and whether you can throw TurboTax on it. Hi, tax season. Um, <laughs> those are the kinds of things you need to start to get to next is this is the playbook of what we're actually going to be doing. This is what we're going to do to protect ourselves, how we're going to protect our customers and how we're going to imp- protect our employees. So that would be kind of part two. Get your stuff, figure it out, document it, more documentation. This is the actual playbook, if you will, and then starting getting into other things. The moral of the story of traditional is what you're going to see is everything is ad hoc and that's fine. You got to start somewhere. So you're going to have ad hoc. You're doing it. You're you most likely are doing it already. When we start to have people, our conversations like this with, with organizations, you say, do you do this? And they say, well, yeah, but it's not formal. We haven't documented. And again, that's fine. You are doing it. All you're doing with the documentation is you're saying, I'm going to do this at least once a year, right? And so you're getting into things that are taking away the ad hoc Ness, ad hocness is that a phrase anyways you're, you're you're starting to formalize it and make it very consistent going forward and we typically get very um these heavy these, into security in general we talk about physical assets this includes app dev too not every organization does application development but there should be a life cycle that goes with app dev too that should not be ad hoc there should be layers of how do you ensure that the code you're developing is is clean am i using open source in it um, how do I test it? How do I validate it's not full of holes or vulnerabilities, et cetera, et cetera. So those things start to need to mature as well as we're going through this process of how do we do things? How are we going to make it consistent? How are we going to then audit it to validate that we are doing the right things? And one of the things I want to put in here with the audit piece, I know I said it, and it's probably a dirty word to a lot of people. Audit is not a dirty word. Audit is just validating that we're doing the things we said we were going to do. The way organizations get better is a continual improvement process. Mm-hmm. And again, they're not designed to be punitive, or and if they are, they're wrong. We can help you with that too. Um, what they are designed to do is consistent, right? We want to make sure that we consistently do the things we want because we want a great deliverable. Um, you know, if you get into all kinds of uh, business development type stuff, you start to hear things like just cause and whatnot. It's the real reason you do things. And what you're really trying to do is you're trying to support your cause of your organization. You're not doing it because it's written down or we're trying to get somebody or catch them doing something bad. We're doing this because it's the right thing to do for the reasons we want to do things in business. Yeah. One of the things that is often lacking in especially the small business is a plan. Uh, and and so these are the couple things that before you start going, you know, I, I know we started talking a little bit about multi-factor and EDR at the beginning yeah. before you even jump into stuff like that, because that's just a subcomponent and that's more the, the tactical components of zero trust. But over on more of the strategic side is, number one, build out the plan. And one of the things that is often lacking as well is it's the IT person or the security person that's building in. They're not looping in the business leaders oftentimes, but when you go down this journey, No, you know, kind of gone are the days of IT is just the silo operating off to the side. It is a core component that can drive businesses forward or slow them down. And so ensuring that it aligns with business goals is critical. But then once you say, okay, we want to start down the zero trust journey, put together a timeline that you want to, sorry, hit certain goals. And so what this means is, these, you know, these, I think on the prior podcast that I've done is, okay, maybe in year one or, you know, certain quarters, we need to hit certain goals to be able to hit to the next, you know, level essentially, right? Um, and maybe there's certain projects that have to come first to keep maturing the organization. And so this is something that CID, CIT did years ago, um, and we've continued to refine it. I'm not going to give you the details of the uh, the architecture changes that we've made for anyone that's listening uh, that's maybe a little more on the red team side. But <laughs> what we did do is say, we are going to make fundamental changes here at CIT to better harden our own network, and it's going to take three years to get there or, you know, 18 months to get there. Um, And then from there, we designated all the key projects that we had to get to and then assign out the key owners and the budgets and everything like that associated with it. 
Uh, so that way, when we're doing our budget cycle, you can't just pull away those funds because it's going to derail that entire initiative, right? Um, but being able to slip those in, plan for them long term is what's going to drive you forward. So many businesses get stuck on the zero trust because they look at there's one budget, let's say it's $6,000, and then you come back again later on with, well, now I need $12,000 and now I need that, right? And it's just that constant draw that just is painful rather than being upfront and say, here's the full plan and here's the full budget to get us there. Yeah, I I, I was going to put in the budget stuff, but you you beat me to it, which is great. I had a big nod for anybody that's not on, on video. Um, but I agree with what Nate's talking about here. As you're going through this process, you are going to need your business partners to help you through the process. If you're in IT or you're in cybersecurity, you can't do it alone, nor should you. There's no reason for you to do it. So if you go through the way cybersecurity typically works in a mature organization, you usually will start to do a lot of things that get into the how you do things. So IT cybersecurity, you tend to be the custodians of data. Most people will look at you and say, you're my IT, you're the owner. Yeah, that is incorrect. HR is the owner of the HR information. Accounting is the owner of the accounting information. They're the individuals that say this person can or cannot have access. This is the person that can have write access. This person can only have read, et cetera. And therefore, they are the owners. When you bring in the owners, you're going to get additional insights to a lot of other things. And this will get into other podcasts that I won't bother with today. But for example, it gets into how critical is that asset? If something were to happen, how fast can I recover? When do I need to recover it by? How far do I need to go back into time? So the RTO, RPOs of the bird, and I'm sure we've got a podcast for that if we don't already have scheduled. Um, but it also gets the ownership with them too. So when Nate's getting into the budget aspect of things and you're saying, I've got this dollar amount allocated and someone says, yeah, but I need that for something else. The answer is, no, you, you remember when we agreed it, this is what we were going to do. And we did that because you needed a restoration timeline of X. Because of that, we need this funding. Oh, okay, well, I'm on board. Continue doing that path. I'll go find some money elsewhere. That does help. Um, but it does help that you get by and it's not all you anymore. You do get the help through the entire implementation. And it does help you as an individual, whether you're in IT security or even in any one of these other departments that are out there. Um, absolutely critical and in, in, in the planning process. And you never get most of your projects done if you don't have buy-in from the organization as a whole. These yeah, I've, I've definitely heard someone who's probably made at some point said zero trust being a real mindset, you know, um, it's not just these quick little check marks that we're doing. It is a full company initiative. Um, we kind of touched on this, but I, I wanted to push you guys a little bit more. Let's say there is this fictional company who has hit this, you know, traditional stage. What are they doing really well and where are they falling short? What does it look like yeah. to be in that stage? I love that you asked this because I was just thinking about actually going through <laughs> the the items in this traditional stage. Love it. Um, so, I, again, we've talked about what it is, why you're doing it, how to actually start it, plan it all out. Now we're going to get into the, the technical component, or sorry, not technical, the tactical components of this. So, again, going back to the categories, identity, right, is passwords, um, maybe without MFA um, or, you know, you're purely using passwords. The industry is moving to actually get away from passwords altogether, right? This is things like pass keys and FIDO and hardware tokens, that type of stuff, because People are the ones that still keep giving it up. Uh, if you go look at Google, again, they don't have really any compromises because they are now full hardware authentication. Um, again, those on-premise, that 1999 Active Directory, um, right? you are doing very, very few assessments to figure out who and what accounts um, still exist in your environment. Uh, maybe you don't even know which employees are there. <laughs> Right. You don't have a good list of active employees unless you go ask HR pay or you know, the payroll people. Um, but IT might never see that. Um, again, manual processes for user creation and removal. Maybe, again, the, the processes aren't there for the internal communication between departments. Um, moving over into the device category is do you even know what hardware you have? Right. Most people. Sorry, I'm going to say I'm going to make a broad assumption immature organizations that are in this traditional stage mm -hmm. don't know 
right? They don't have a list of uh, devices, serial numbers. When you give an employee a new device, do you even document that or did you just hand them something, um, right? There's very, very limited access to or system He's hardening base or like baseline configurations. There is none, right? You install Windows, you sign in, and you hand it to the user. You've done nothing to necessarily um, harden the system before it goes out. Or maybe you're doing things in a manual process, such as what Todd had mentioned. You're manually loading up the antivirus or the EDR solution. You're, you don't have a automated process to ensure that those got installed. Maybe you were busy um, or something. Um, moving into more of the networks. Flat networks is a pretty telltale tell sign that you're in a uh, traditional environment there. So everything can just kind of talk to each other on the environment. Um, makes it really easy to manage because you don't have to manage much. Um, but in the event that you have some type of security incident, everything can be connected to in one fell suite. When you get into the more mature levels, again, we'll talk about segmented networks and all the way into the concepts of micro segmentation. That's for another day. Um, when it comes to applications, again, do you even know what applications exist in your environment? Because many organizations don't. I couldn't tell you the number of times that I've seen TurboTax installed, like Todd had mentioned, Spotify installed, all that type of stuff. Um, I'll call out applications where do you even know where they, those software originates from? Um, so for if there's anyone listening on here, we just did a federal uh, podcast. Are you using 7-Zip in your environment? Did you know that was developed in Russia? Right? Um, stuff like that, right? There's there's things that you need to be aware of. Um, and then getting into the data, do you even know what data you have? Again, I called out the HR. Um, I've talked to IT professionals in the past said, do you have PHI in your environment? No, I don't believe so. Do you have an HR folder where they're <laughs> saving all your employment records? Well, yeah. Okay, you probably have... Uh, PII sitting in there. I think I said PHI, which is healthcare records. Mm -hmm. PII is more your social security numbers and stuff. Um, and then also data for classification. If you don't have some type of data classification process, uh, what this means is, are you identifying uh, files that should be classified as this is for public release, this is for internal use, this is highly confidential. Um, and then if you don't have at least tagging on your documents and data, you're not going to be able to do anything about it. So we see this in more mature organizations. If you're doing a lot of work with like the DOD and everything, that's where the concept of CUI uh, controlled info, forgot the U right now, but CUI. Um, and are you encrypting any of that data? Uh, a lot of organizations are not encrypting data. So it's easily taken and this is why ransomware and extortion is so easy these days, because you get in, grab the data, post it to a leak site and say, I got all your data. I'm going to leak it unless you pay me a million dollars. Right. So that's what sure it looks if, like. <clears throat> uh, sorry, I was going to say, if anybody's on the podcast and you're yelling at Nate, yes, we know it's unclassified information. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, so that being said, if if as I was going through that, um, sorry, there is uh, I'm on a Mac, so it does little uh, things if you saw that on video. Um, <laughs> with that being said, um, as I was going through that, um, he's, if he's, that sounded like you, that's OK, right? But that means that you are in a spot where you need to put that plan together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I was going to kind of echo those terms as we're kind of getting close to wrapping up here is. Most people are probably somewhere on that spectrum. Again, being in traditional is not a bad spot. You're in a spot. That's great. At least you've got the awareness and you can begin going to the next plan or start planning. If you don't know how to do that, obviously, there's resources out there that can help. CIT obviously is one of those. But the intent is, is you may not have all the pieces in place yet. A lot of it is going to be ad hoc. A lot of it's going to be manual. That's okay. As long as you're doing it, you're you're moving forward, you're getting more mature, and that's kind of the name of the game when it comes to cybersecurity. There's an old joke that says you don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun Nate. Um, <laughs> and that's fine too, but Nate's a bit ahead of you at the moment, so you're going to have to run a little harder. And, and again, there, there's plenty of help out there for you if you need that. Yeah, I'd love to, um, you know, anything else you want to share, but something that 
came up while you were speaking is we talk about all these things that you need. You need X, but we're moving away from that. You need Y, but we're moving away from that. Is this a moving target? Can can businesses actually hit this traditional and then make it to this optimal stage? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, there, there's a lot that goes into it. I, if you're, we have a tendency to look at a lot of different tools at CIT, and we we do often in, embrace best of breed type tools, and there's a reason mm-hmm. for it. If you're picking the right tools, they're not just there to be a tool that's now in the market. They're typically in that spot because they're adapting with the world, right? So if you're looking at I'll just throw out some random vendor names and you can you can say, yeah, I hate them or no, it doesn't matter to me. But, you know, if you're looking at the Cisco's, you're looking at the Sentinel ones, you're looking at Okta, a lot of them are continuously developing. In some cases, they're doing acquisitions of other tools to help them fill the gaps. And so while the target is moving more often, the, the tool sets that you're picking, and I realize what I'm talking about is mostly logical controls. A lot of those do have the ability to adapt with the industry, with the trends, et cetera. And so you're naturally getting the ability to adapt with the, what's going on in the world. Um, the things that obviously wouldn't be as easy to do that is going to be a lot of the stuff that you're doing manually, and that's going to be your pos- policy development and whatnot. But there's ways to go through that, too. It is hard, though. I mean, as Nate mentioned, it, it's a it's a long run. You don't just simply pull things out and put a new software application in, and it just fixes things. There is no zero trust software application that solves everything for you. I was going to say, if you if you got sold on a vendor that said, buy this for, and you have zero trust, that's wrong. Uh, so <laughs> it, it just ask them, where where does this apply zero trust, right? Um, because it, it goes farther further than everything else. But um, the other thing I just want to say about the moving target is, Security in general is a lot of blocking and tackling at the basics, and that applies across industries and it applies essentially across time as well, right? Um, there are some things that do change, but we've always known you need to have a password to get into something, right? That doesn't really change a whole lot. Now we're moving a little bit away from passwords, but they still exist today, and it'll, they'll be a lot around for a long time as well. Um, so have better passwords, right? But if you go take a look at the top 100 bad password list, the top five are the same top five as the last five years. Um, it's people are not changing the 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 thought process and the, the cultures that they're trying to do. But those are the things that are sticky and they're foundational and they're the building blocks. That is the strong foundation that you build the rest of it on. Um, and so when you do the hard work to build a solid foundation, it doesn't really change all that often, right? Um, now, there are c- certain things you do say, okay, we move from more of a on-prem environment to a cloud environment. A lot of the same hardening standards apply, right? Is tighten down controls, have the proper processes to validate a project before you actually deploy it. Um, and so once you start changing that culture, You've already hit a lot of the basic uh, things in that traditional standpoint. Now you're getting more into those initials. And then that's maybe where some of the tools start changing a little bit. Um, but the concept applies. These, yeah, and I mean, the other thing that I'll add to it is <clears throat> um, the traditional security, the moat, the walls, et cetera, that was around for decades. This transition to zero trust is is relatively new, even though we said it's a decade old already. Um, it's not like it's a massive shift. You don't see a major shift on how that's deployed every two years. That's not what's happening. Most of the stuff that you're seeing that's new and improved typically is designed to remove the friction that employees deal with. So getting to password, while it, it there is a security benefit, getting, oh, excuse me, let me try that again. Getting to password list, while there is a benefit to it from a security perspective, it's also designed to make it much easier for the employees to do their jobs, right? You're not trying to crank in a 15 plus character password that's incredibly complex and unique for every application. You're trying to streamline it for people. So yes, it is adapting, but there's as much security as there is ease of use built into it and trying to remove the opportunity to be in a bad spot, being hacked, give up credentials, you name it. Mm-hmm. These, these. So we're going to 
continue on this journey going forward. But I'm just excited. as a yeah, I think it's, <laughs> I think it's going to be interesting to kind of talk about all these different stages. Um, just a quick like one minute or less. What does a little bit of that next stage look like? So moving from traditional now to initial. What are the steps that someone will be taking and we'll be diving a little bit more into next time? These these kind of give what, us yeah. yeah kind, of, kind of what I was mentioning before about identify is mm -hmm. once you actually know what you have, um, you're gonna be in a much better spot. Um now there are some processes that come into this, but um, such as Okay, now I know which employees exist in my environment and I've done a, a quick review to validate that old ones are gone. Okay, let's put in a process that says when HR hires or terminates someone, we've built out the communication between that to ensure that we have a repeatable process. Okay, now we have a device inventory list. Let's put in the process that says when I hand one out, I update the inventory list. Or when I retrieve one, I update the inventory list. Um, applications, I've introduced a new core application to the business. Did I document that process, right? Uh, did you have a ticket or something that says, these, I implemented uh, these, I'm, I'm on, the, on the finance side right now. So Jack Henry or, you know, whatever it is, right? Um, but we've done some type of project to introduce new, a new vendor or something along those lines. Um, data, we've done an inventory of our data. Here's where the sensitive files live. And we've documented where that is. Please don't just keep that, uh, basically index your files out on the public share, uh, lock that down a little bit. So if someone doesn't get in and just say, oh, that's where all the sensitive files are. Right. Um, but sorry, I was, I was looking at something today and, uh, someone literally had pass.txt with all their passwords on something today. So I was like, okay, we're, we're still battling a little bit of that. But um, I think that's funny. I, we're going to briefly interrupt you. Is I think it's funny because when you were saying, what does it look like? I was going to say you stop using password.xls and you changed the name to tonercartridges.xls. <laughs> yep. Yep. There was a recent scan. And again, when you're, when you're doing the quick scan and you see pass.txt, you're like, I hope that's not what it is. I hope it's a password, it like a concert or something. No, it's the passwords of everything. So, um, but again, if you're going to be saying we need to I, at least identify and document where these files are, again, that's the early stages of that data classification. Um, do we use just those basic things start really pushing you up? Um, and it all comes down to identify and building repeatable processes. Yeah, I'll actually keep it to a minute. So I'll... Uh, Sorry, I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> there are things that are we talked about it, right? Starting to put automation in place. A good, a good example would be having a standard build of Windows that you can push onto a device and it's the same consistent build every single time. Um, encrypting your data at rest or in transit would be another good one. And starting to do network segmentation. So if you're in manufacturing, your shop floor's probably got old legacy equipment that potentially has vulnerabilities, you want to make sure that that information does not have the ability to access accounting data, for example. Or if you're in a, a city with a police department, same concept, right? City data is separate from PD and CGIS information and so forth. So those are the things that are just starting to get you to the next level. It's just little steps. They're not complicated, but they do start to get you to the next level. And, the, and really where you're starting to get into, and Nate's alluded to this, is automation. Automation is going to be where we really start to see the big steps, the big progressions, the big changes in maturity. Yeah. These I'm excited. I'm excited for this series. I think it's going to be great. Me too. Uh, thank you so much, Todd and Nate, for joining us today. Uh, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss our next Zero Trust series. Uh, if you have a question you'd like us um, to discuss on this on this podcast, please reach out to us at info at cit-net.com or head out to our website, cit-net.com slash podcast. And we'll be back next week with an all new episode. <laughs>